This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. One. Aloha, this is Rob Hack with another edition of Exporting from Hawaii. Today, my guest is a good friend and one of the busiest people I know is Jimmy Chan. He is general manager of the Hawaiian Chip Company here in Honolulu. Welcome, Jimmy. Aloha. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, besides being general manager of the Hawaiian Chip Company, I know you're also on the board of the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. You're on the board of the Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii, and you're president of the Hawaii Food Manufacturers Association. Is that yep. correct? Yep. Anything I don't know? Any uh, other organization? Not that I'm aware of yet. So with all of that, how do you have time to make chips? You know, it, it's 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 a little it's a little rough, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think um, you know all those organizations uh, provide uh, great support for for the. Um, for the food manufacturing industry and um, even what what I do as uh, the Hawaiian chip company so um, for me I feel like um, I, I it's making time for those com for those organizations is no problem okay you know? great now tell us about the Hawaiian chip company when did it start and how did it start so it started um, you know almost 20 years ago I basically uh, I was coming out of college trying to figure out what to do with the rest of my life. I had a speech communications degree, um, not a very good grade point average, so um, future ac more academics was looking unlikely, and uh, I just needed something to do. And um, I was uh, I I saw Emerald Lagasse make some sweet potato chips on his Emerald Live show, where he used to do bam with the garlic and that whole bit. Mm. And I saw these Okinawan sweet potatoes on the counter when I went to go grab another beer. And I thought, hey, you know what? Let's, let's try and make these. So I sliced them up thin, put them in hot oil on a stove, took them out, passed them out to friends, family. Um, next thing you know, people started asking, hey, can I, can I buy a bag? Um, so um, we thought, hey, you know what? Let's go ahead and build this chip company and uh, and let's uh, you know sell it off in two years and make millions and retire early and this and that and uh, you know uh, it you know it, it was it was a lot of fun I got I got friends together we invested a little bit of money extra beer money and uh, you know we we were just um, trying to sell them at the swap meets at the trade shows um, trying to get into stores um, but the cool thing was owning our own business, right. you know, and having the freedom to come in late, you know, after you go tr try surfing in the morning, then you leave early to go play soccer and hit the bar. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, lo and behold, that led to some dire financial um, situations, no which um, we had to really clean up. And uh, we did so and just kind of refocused and added um, stuff like taro to the line, which, um, by stroke of luck, Frito Leo was making taro chips out of their halava plant. And um, as we were kind of refocusing and retooling the company, um, they closed up that plant. And when we started making taro chips, we, we filled that void that they left in the market. And that's what kind of helped propel us into, um, oh, into more stability. Wow. Yep. So when did you move into the facility, your main facility on Nimitz Highway? So that that happened. So we started in 2000 officially. Um, that facility was about 2008. So after, after you know, the first couple of years we ran into trouble, then it was five years of actually building a real company. Mm -hmm. um, and then by 2008, um, the banks were finally ready to take us seriously. And... Um, said, hey, you know what, we'll loan you the money for this, for this factory because we believe you have a good product and now you have a good company. Well, that's great. Um, and at the facility on Nimitz, you have and you want customers to visit you there. Is that right? Yes. Um, you know, that was the, the initial concept of the, the chip company was to set up and do retail, um, kind of mimicking what Big Island Candies is doing mm -hmm. um, in Hilo. And uh, our other location was just poor for that, um, but by 2008, when we moved to this bigger facility, we started to explore with export, you know, and trying to eye, you know, export to the, not just export internationally, but increasing sales to the mainland. 
So at that point, we didn't really um, have a retail store or anything set up. Um, but after about three or four years of trying that we, and, and getting experience in the export market, we decided, hey, you know what? We need to get the tourists down to our place and give them an experience that they'll take back with them and then create the demand for our product. So, so now, yes, Absolutely. you can come down to our, um, to our factory and actually get the chips, not just prepackaged, but made to order, oh, wow. which is what these bags here are. And they're warm. And they're, they're hot they're out of the fryer. Right, right out of the fryer, oh, and boy. then you get to put your own seasonings. So, oh, that's so great. So you choose from 20 different seasonings and make your own combinations and develop your own personalized experience. Oh, that's perfect for the tourist market. Tell us a little bit, um, what, what types of chips do you have? So we got, so like I said, uh, we started with the purple chips. You see those darker chips mm -hmm. in there? That's um, the purple Okinawan potato. Um, you know, those, those are grown on the, on the Big Island. Um, we actually just got a, got a shipment uh, from Maui, and that's looking pretty viable wow. as far as the source goes. Um, we also use taro, like I said. Um, we, 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 um, we buy everything on the local market that meets spec. Um, if we do need to bring some in, we can mm. um, to supplement supply. And then we also have these orange sweet potatoes, which really make the bag um, pop, uh, you know, as far as color goes. Oh, and yeah, definitely. We initially got those from Molokai. Um, we were getting them from Molokai, but then the, the deer over, that have over on Molokai um, mm. started interfering with the farm, and, and then eventually we had to shift to a supplier on the Big Island. Okay, great. And... More recently, you were marketing these fantastic sauces, which I've told you about. We uh, use a lot at my house. Um, tell us about the sauces. When did that start? <clears throat> so the sauces started um, as uh, right about when we were trying to do our initial push to the mainland. Um, it was getting a little frustrating uh, because um, our chips only have a short shelf life. It, Three months. Three months. Um, so by the time you get it shipped up there, you're down to two months, Ooh. and you know it. It was it was becoming a tough tough sell. Um, and I thought, you know what? Nobody actually makes a, a barbecue sauce that's actually spicy. Ooh. So we had a chip flavor called Kilauea Fire, um, which was one of my favorites. It was a blend of habanero, cayenne, smashed into a garlic base. And I took that seasoning and added it to an old family barbecue recipe, and we came up with this, the Kilauea Fire, um, Kilauea Fire um, barbecue sauce. So that's sort of the flagship sauce right now. Yep, that's, that's the original. And then um, in trying to get, what we found is that, it, like you said, it goes with breakfast, it goes with um, hot dogs, hamburgers, french fries. So to give it more utility, instead of just waiting till people barbecue, we we added more heat, more habanero, more cayenne, and started marketing this hot sauce, which is our number one retail seller on the store shelves. Um, the barbecue is our number one s seller um, uh, food service to restaurants. Oh, interesting. Yep. But it's two complementary products. The, the, the sauce can go on the chips, but yet they're very different products, especially in terms of exporting or shipping, because yep. as you said, the chips have a rather short shelf life of three months ish yep. but the sauces have a shelf life of a year or so so it's much easier to ship those for especially for exporting so yeah. let's talk about that for a second um, tell us what have you done in terms of selling the chips or the sauces to japan for example and i'll just say japan because i know you have a lot of japanese clients that love the products yeah, so for the chips, um, we, we, we initially um, wanted to get into all the Hawaiian stores on the store shelves. Um, like there's a spa resorts that mimic Hawaii, um, sure. and they have huge hula shows there, um, that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, kind of like, um, like what we saw with our attempt to penetrate the market on the West Coast, um, it, it, was, it was difficult because people were still unfamiliar with the brand and the products mm -hmm. um, but what we started to find success with was actually just selling in bulk to restaurants mm -hmm. so becoming part of a menu item and then um, <clears throat> and then uh, what we found is that actually even with our sauces 
we had even more success yeah. because we didn't have the limitations of the short shelf life. Mm -hmm. So the distributor there could ship up a bunch cost effectively and then distribute as needed. Whereas the chips with that short shelf life, a lot of times it's a rush order, air freight, mm -hmm. um, the cost just takes it off of most menus. What kind of restaurants were um, using the are using the chips? Are they Hawaii theme restaurants or Okinawa theme restaurants? You know the Hawaii the Hawaii for the with the chips it's generally um, the Hawaii theme the Hawaii themed uh, restaurants. Um, uh, so you know, and or or executive chefs in really high-end hotels mm, like um, like the the new Otani hotel yeah. um, you know their chef was using it for um, some kind of um, a dish and it, it was you know it's generally either really high-end or or Hawaiian yep and then same same with the sauces although with the sauces we're actually having um, we're having success um, according to my Japanese distributor um, in restaurants that are just more traditional, um, mm -hmm. not not just um, Hawaiian, mm -hmm. but traditional Japanese. Um, they've added it to certain menus, um, and as a component of a menu item, now it's not not hitting that same same uh, same uh, competition as you would as you know trying to compete as a katsu sauce on a store shelf. Right, right? Right, right. We're not going dollar for dollar there. It's just, you know, maybe maybe our sauce costs a little more as part of the menu item, but it can be, it can be it can be um, uh, hidden into the cost of the menu item itself. Oh, that's great. So, yeah, there's so no way you could compete with just standard bulldog katsu sauce nope. there, right? No, nope. and there, it's not not even worth trying to compete there. But where you are unique in that, made in Hawaii, very wholesome, has a great opinion. Word association made in Hawaii in Japan yeah. is just fantastic. It's spicy, which Japan doesn't have a lot, yeah. right? Um, there really isn't a strong domestic manufacturer of um, spicy sauces in Japan. And so this is just fantastic um, product that you're exporting. So you were telling me before the show started that you have a couple of new products that you're going to start sending to Japan. Can you tell us about those? Yeah, so um, so basically we've got our base products. We've also got a Raging Volcano. Uh, this is one of the products that's currently sold in Japan. Um, it's a Raging Volcano. It's the same Kilauea Fire seasoning, just on a vinegar base instead of a tomato base. Okay. Um, but now what we're doing with these products is we're adding in a little bit more. You know, you mentioned the strength of the Hawaii brand, mm. and um, you know, uh, tropical fruit is a big part of that brand. Mm. Um, and what what's what's more, um, you know, uh, synonymous with Hawaii than uh, lily koi and uh, mango Absolutely. and uh, pineapples, right? Absolutely. Um, so we're we've started to incorporate those flavors into these sauces. And uh, the first one that we're rolling out and that we're going to introduce into the to the Jap Japan market this year is our lily koi versions of the raging volcano, and also um, the lily koi barbecue sauce. Wow, I'm so. excited to try that because it's two of my favorite flavors mashed together, lily koi and um, spicy sort of habanero type sauce. I can't wait to try that. So on that note, we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back with uh, Exporting from Hawaii with Jimmy Chan from the Hawaiian Chip Company. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. When I was growing up, I was among the one in six American kids who struggle with hunger. And hungry mornings make tired days. Grumpy days. That kind of days. But with the power of breakfast, the kids in your neighborhood can think big and be more. When we're not hungry for breakfast, we're hungry for more. More ideas. More dreams. More fun. When kids aren't hungry for breakfast, they can be hungry for more. Go to hungeris.org and lend your time or your voice to make breakfast happen for kids in your neighborhood. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, 
Let's take Healthy back. Aloha. Welcome back to Exporting from Hawaii. I'm Rob Hack, and our guest today is Jimmy Chan, who is general manager of the Hawaiian Chip Company. And we're fortunate that he's brought a bunch of his products here to show us. Before the break, we were salivating over the new Lily Koi um, hot sauce that will be coming out of the Kilauea Fire brand hot sauce that they're getting ready to ship to Japan. So let's talk about the Japanese market again and stay on that topic for a few minutes. Um, it's no secret that we're fortunate enough in Hawaii to have a lot of Japanese tourists coming here every year. But roughly 2019 should see about 1.8 million. Uh, most of those coming through Oahu, mm -hmm. through Honolulu International Airport, a lot of them coming into Waikiki, but certainly in the Honolulu metropolitan area, we have we have a great opportunity to market to these tourists. So, can you share with our audience how are you marketing to the Japanese tourist, and what's the difference between your marketing in Japan to the Japanese market there? And is your distributor or agent involved in that? And how does that work? So, trying to build in a feedback loop between selling in the local market and then driving demand in um, the homeland market? Well, I think, um, I think a lot of it's just trying to build um, familiarity. You know, um, you know, I think uh, in that market, they tend to kind of follow, you know, follow the next guy. Mm -hmm. And if there's a line, they'll stand in that line to see what's at the, um, at the end of it. And uh, we're just trying to cultivate an experience that's compelling enough for them to want to stand in a line in front of the Hawaiian chip company. And uh, a lot of that, uh, you know, comes from, uh, for, for us, what we're, what we're doing is we're trying to mimic, basically, what we see in Japan. Because, um, you know, as, as a speech major, there wasn't a lot I could do with my degree, but one of the things that we learned in, in that was in interpersonal communication. People tend to project communication the way they want it received. Sure. So, you know, we, we go up to Japan and you see the customer service and you see, you know, them handing you, you know, your, your money on a tray and presenting you with things to try. First thing, first thing you, you come up to the booth and, and even just their value on freshness and, you know, um, uh, hot senbei and arare and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And that's where this this attempt at, uh, you, or this, this um, way of packaging the chips, fresh from the fryers, kind of speaks to that. Um, and even just getting to season your own chips. People were like, hey, McDonald's, McDonald's is, is copying you with their season their own fries. And I'm like, well, you know, that's, that's great, but I actually stole the idea from McDonald's <laughs> Japan. You know, and, and that's, that's kind of what, what, um, what we do. And that's, that's actually a big part of, um, you know, um, going up to Japan, it's it's about going with my distributor, seeing what works, what actually is well received by their local culture, and then trying to mimic certain aspects of that here while maintaining our identity as a Hawaii company. It's a, you bring up a very interesting point about going to the target market in your case, Japan, keeping your eyes open and learning yep. and trying to adopt some of what you see, not entirely because you need your product to be unique, but at least try to adopt some local packaging um, standards and what have you. Did, you. did you have to change anything about your packaging to go to Japan? Um, you know, we, we, do have, um, we do have labels that we, for, for certain, certain products, we have labels that, will, that are in, translated into Japanese that um, my distributor would just stick stick on over the bottles, mm -hmm. um, but what we found is the with our um, by concentrating on the food service market, um, we're able to just bypass that. bypass that, and that's that's been a little 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 easier um, for us. What does your distributor do for you in Japan? Um, I, distributors can run the gamut of being very involved or not very involved, and it just depends on what your relationship is with the distributor what you need from them. So explain to the audience, in your case, what does the distributor do? Are they involved in the importation of the product and the paperwork, or are they um, 
involved in the marketing aspect of the product? How does it work for you? So for for our company, it's it's pretty much full service. Um, you know, like uh, he's he's out there trying to um, to secure new accounts. Um, so it's hitting hitting the pavement, introducing product, participating at trade shows, um, taking orders, and then uh, placing orders, and then uh, figuring out how. For, for me, how to get my products to Japan, mm -hmm. helping me with all the in, um, export documents. Um, and then even in Japan, um, it's about, yeah, trying to figure out the best mechanism to, to promote the products, um, you know. Great. Products like this, especially the, uh, the sauces that are heavy, dense, liquids, um, particularly the products that ship in glass bottles, they're heavy. And so it's much more cost efficient to ship by ocean. Is that what you're doing, generally speaking, shipping pallets at a time? You know, um, generally speaking, it's that's probably the best way to ship mm -hmm. the sauces. Um, but uh, some sometimes we run into good problems, like uh, you Rush know, orders. yeah, uh, you know, we're or one of our big accounts every year is um, Kua Kua Aina Burger mm -hmm. in Japan for yeah, the good. for the sauces and. Uh, you know, they based their projections for last summer on the prior summer's performance, and halfway through the summer, it, out, it was outperforming, and they they need a product right away, so we had to so. ship it, to get it, get it over to the air air cargo, and um, get it over there as soon as possible. And you know, of course, that mean, meant smaller margins for somebody, but uh, but you know, sure. I have a good relationship with my distributor, so we were able to work it out. Well, that's good. So you're shipping mostly by ocean from Hawaii directly to probably Yokosuka or um, a port near there, and then inland transportation to wherever the product is needed. You mentioned off camera that it's been difficult for you to make any headway in the Australian market because there's no shipping directly from Hawaii to Australia by ocean. It would have to yeah. go to the mainland first, probably Long Beach, and then off to Australia. Yep. that makes it cost prohibitive. Yep. Person. So yeah, I mean that that I mean that added on an, an additional you know at least ten to fifteen percent on top of the ten to fifteen percent that you know we would have paid anyways to get it to the west coast or whatever, and it it just took us it priced us out of out of market. Are there any inbound duties or tariffs involved in bringing the product into Japan? Um, you know there there are. Um, it's just. Again, I kind of rely on my to distributor handle. to handle that, That's and um, with that, he'll bundle it into his price. And at, at that point, it's just up to the up to the customer. And that's why, again, being part of a menu ingredient mm -hmm. is a lot more viable for at least for my company because we're not going to be able to scale up and save on costs, um, you know, uh, immediately. So it's it. It kind of it kind of works well that we're targeting that food service um, food service category first as we grow our infrastructure in Hawaii. There's a big trade show every year in March called Foodex in uh, Makuhari yeah. in Japan. You're, I assume you're going to that. Yes. And um, the Hawaiian chip company products are you exhibit there? Are you in a Hawaii booth? Pavilion, I should say. Yep. So, so generally, um, we've we've um, partnered up with um, our distributor. He he takes an active part in helping us set up, um, and we'll 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 take part in um, in uh, part of the um, generally the Department of Agriculture mm. uh, of Hawaii, Hawaii, Department, Hawaii of Department of Agriculture will set up a pavilion, and uh, within that pavilion, um, we'll either find space as a part of their seal of quality program or even sometimes um, part of their pavilion will be um, uh, uh, partitioned off for um, Hawaii Food Manufacturers Association participation which was actually how I first got my introduction into Japan it was taking part as part of uh, Hawaii Food Manufacturers booth within the Department of Ag pavilion and that helps offset a lot of costs too oh, because otherwise I mean if we were to participate on our own you're looking at Six thousand dollars for just yeah. the booth, at and least. yeah, let alone travel and what yeah. have you. 
Yep. No, I, I, I absolutely agree with you that these Hawaii pavilions, either through DBETS pavilions or um, Department of Agriculture pavilions, are a great way for the Hawaii companies to get into these markets cost effectively. And you were saying that you use uh, FoodX or uh, some other trade shows as a way to test products in Japan and see what the market feedback is. Can you talk about about that for a second? Yeah. So so we'll we'll go up and we'll we'll actually um we'll actually assist our distributor in passing out samples and seeing just seeing just seeing what resonates. Um, just seeing the reaction. I mean, like you know, the, there's Food X show and then uh, another one that we participate in uh, was is the DBET um, sponsored pavilion at the Tokyo International Gift Show. Mm -hmm. And that thing gets almost 200,000 people through that thing. Um, yeah, so remarkable. there's really no other oppor no better opportunity to get that volume of, um, of um, people to try your products and give you an honest assessment. Um, and so from there, that's how we've kind of shrunk our product line because you know if you look at our entire product line we've probably got you know 20 to 25 different items and this and that but um these are really the ones that have resonated at those shows and resulted in orders so with that that's what we push into the market and that's why we're going to test out this lily koi to see if it is as well received as it's being received here Oh, I hope so. I hope it does well. Yeah. Um, we're going to wrap up soon. Can we bring up uh, a slide on the contact info for the Hawaiian chip company? And while this slide is up, the, I, I just put here some shops that I know on Oahu where people can buy your products. But tell us, where can people get these products? You had mentioned um, sometimes available on Hawaiian Airlines. Are there others? Yeah, so um, yeah, Hawaiian Airlines has been a tremendous account for us. Um, we actually just got into um, Sam's Club. Okay, great. Yeah, so you can get the uh, taro chips in Sam's Club. Um, a lot of people do get our chips at Costco. Um, and then also, let's see. Um, I've seen it at Times. Yeah, so Times, Longs, and of course, um, KTA on the Big Island. You know, okay. they're kind of, kind of um, I'm from the Big Island, so they, they, I don't know if it's just as a favor to me uh, mm -hmm. or what, but they're one of the first guys to pick up any of the products that I, that I offer. And if people would like to visit the facility, what's the address on Nimitz? Um, or behind, it's behind Nimitz. Yep, yeah, so it's actually, on, you can see the building on, from Nimitz, but you have to enter on Republican Street, which is parallel to Nimitz, right, 1928 right. Republican Street. Great. And your hours of operation? Um, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, and then Saturdays 10 to 3. Well, great. Jimmy, mahalo very, for being here. We greatly appreciate your time. We're a very busy person, and thank you for showing off these fantastic products and telling us about your exporting activities at the Hawaiian Chip Company. Uh, mahalo. This is Rob Hack from Exporting from Hawaii. Thank you. Thank you.